Michael read just now to us from Book of James, chapter 2, 14 to 26. It's very, very simple and very simple to understand that passage is self-explanatory about how genuine faith will result in good deeds. And we are saved by faith, but that faith, if it's genuine, will, will have expressions. But why is this debate on whether faith and deeds are part along with faith? Simply because the, the salvation of Christ given to us is received when we believe in our heart he rose from the dead and confess the mouth Jesus Christ as the Lord. Uh, Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10. When you believe in the heart he rose from the dead and confess Jesus Christ as the Lord, you are saved. For the heart and the belief is justified, confess the mouth and you are saved. It's a very simple thing, very, very simple. But then, do we really believe in a heart? How do you know that someone believes in his heart or not? We don't know, but God knows. So, when we believe in a heart and then confess, that's when we are saved. It is so simple salvation. It's by faith we are saved, the Bible says. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 1, we read, Since we justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we gain access by faith in this grace in which we now stand. So salvation reception is very, very simple. We repent, we believe, and accept Him as Savior and Lord. Now, there are many people who just say, Lord, Lord. And uh, we look at their lives very, very different from what they should be. And I have this question, is he really saved? How do you know he is saved? And the Lord gave a very simple uh, test to identify the genuine people of God and the false people of God. You will know them by the fruit. Matthew 7, chapter, verse 15, also verse 21 onwards. You will know them by the fruit. And he, Jesus said, many will come on that day and say, I draw demons, I prophesy, and miraculous signs. And uh, then Jesus said, I, 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 I will say, I never even knew you, evil doers. Because who, the, he would have the will of the Father is one who is going to be saved. The will of the Father is we all believe in Jesus. So now, when it's so simple to receive the gift of salvation, believe in heart and confess Jesus Christ Lord, you are saved. Now, in letter of Paul to Timothy, in 2 Timothy, chapter 2, 19, 20, 21, it's written, Paul writes, The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must depart from iniquity, must turn from wickedness. Just compare that with Romans 10, 9 and 10. Romans 10, 9 and 10, Paul says, Believe in the heart, you rose from the dead, and confess this guy as Lord. Now, we don't know who believes in the heart or not. We share the gospel, people respond, and God knows the heart. So this verse explains, the Lord knows those who are his. We may not know those who are his, but he knows those who are his. Who believe in the heart, he rose from the dead. And everyone confesses the name of the Lord must depart from iniquity. Then uh, Paul goes on to write to Timothy in verse 20, 21. In a large house, there are articles of gold and silver, wood and stone. Some are for noble purposes, some for ignoble purposes. When a man cleanses himself from the latter, that means wickedness, he brings himself from noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. So the gist of what we are saying here is that genuine faith in Christ will have expression. Expression of holiness, of love, and our labor for the Lord. Work by faith. So genuine faith will have expression. We are saved by faith. But faith will result certain actions, as James spoke about Abraham. Now, Abraham was righteous because he believed. When he returned from the defeat of the kings, he rescued Lot. He refused to take the plunder from the war. He refused to take. Otherwise, he thought, they will say, they made Abraham rich. He refused to take any, any uh, uh, you know, plunder from the war. And uh, when he does that, he refused to take anything. God speaks to him and says, Genesis 15, chapter verse 1, Don't be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your very great reward. You refuse to take the plunder, which belonged to you. You won the war, you can take it from the enemies. You refuse to take it. Don't be afraid. 
I am your shield. I am your reward. And Abraham goes on to say, I don't have any offspring. Who's going to inherit my uh, inheritance, my property? Only I don't have anything of my own. Only Eleazar, the servant, is going to get my property. And then the Lord tells him, no, no, no. I am going to give children like the stars in the universe from your own uh, flesh, that be offspring, meaning Isaac. And uh, Genesis 15, chapter 6 says, Abraham believed God and was reckoned to be righteous. He believed God and was reckoned to be righteous. He was about 100 years old at that point of time. 100 years old. And in Romans chapter 4, from verse 18, is written, Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed. So, being part of many nations. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact his body was as good as dead. He was about 100 years old. His womb was also dead. Yet he didn't waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. But being, but gave glory to God, being fully persuaded, didn't weaken his faith, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Against all hope based on circumstances, 100 years old, God told him he would have a son. In hope, in what God told him, he believed. So he became father of many nations. He was righteous because he believed. And the Lord's word says, so shall your offspring be. Today we are righteous only because we have believed in Jesus. We are made righteous. And Abraham believed God and he certain actions. Now later on, when God tells him, Offer Isaac as a sacrifice, the region of Moriah. He is willing to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. He was willing. And what, where did he get that faith from? By remembering the past. Although he was 100 years old, God told him we were going to have a children in the South Universe from Isaac. He believed, and it happened. And now God says, Offer him as a burnt offering. Burnt offering means the whole night has to smolder in the altar. And 11th chapter of Hebrews, verse 17, 18, 19, it says, By faith, Abraham offered as a sacrifice. Even though it be said of him, so shall offspring, uh, uh, through Abraham, uh, through Isaac, the offspring should be reckoned. Even though God told him through Isaac, going to have children in the universe, by faith, he offered Isaac a sacrifice. He reasoned that God could raise the dead. And, and figuratively speaking, God did raise Isaac from the dead, literally, figuratively speaking. So Abraham's faith was based on what God told him. He was 100 years old. God told him he could have a son. And he had a son, even though circumstances are very, very negative. And his faith was so much, must have been so much uh, empowered, built up. Then God said, offer him as a sacrifice. He acted based on what God spoke to him. He reasoned, yes, I'll offer Isaac a sacrifice. And even though Isaac's body will have smoked on the altar whole night, in the morning from the ashes, God will raise Isaac from the dead. That was his faith. His faith resulted in actions. So genuine faith in Christ will result in actions. Now, actions by themselves will not save you at all. By works, we can never have salvation. In this whole passage, book of James, chapter 2, 14 26, talks about faith. Resulting in actions. Faith without deeds is death. James 2.26 But faith with deeds is the evidence of your salvation. As simple as that. You'll know them by the fruit, God said. So faith in Christ means listening to what he says, acting upon what he says. Abraham believed God, he acted upon that. And therefore he reckoned to be righteous. Now we know that it's not by works we can be saved. Works alone can never save us. In the Old Testament, we read Isaiah 64, chapter 6. All righteous acts are like filthy rags. All righteous acts. And Jews always, somehow, they had a feeling that they must do good works. They must be nice people, do good, help people. Like any, any religion said, do good to others. So, you know, is no different also. And some people came to Jesus and asked a question. In John 6, 28, 
what must you do to do the works God requires? What work should I do? What deeds should I do? What God requires? Deeds, works, plural. The Lord gave an answer. Verse 29. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. The question was, what work should I do? Plural. Answer was singular. The work of God is to believe in the one he has sent. Believing is a verb. It's a word called pisteo in Greek. Believing, trusting, relying, that's what believing is. The corresponding noun for pisteo is pistis, which is faith. Faith is a noun. Corresponding verb is believing. So, when you genuinely believe in Christ, we are saved. Believe in the heart, rose from the dead, confess if Christ is Jesus Christ the Lord, you are saved. But that faith will result in actions. And if you look at uh, uh, that, this is what Jesus told him. The work of God is to believe in one he has sent. The primary work for a believer, for, for any human being, is to believe in Jesus. That's the primary work. Thereafter, other works follow. By works alone, nobody will be saved. Nobody will be saved by works. In Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9, and 10, it's by grace you have been saved through faith, this is not from yourself, it's a gift of God. Not by works that no one can boast. So by works, nobody is saved. It's by the grace of God we are saved, by faith in Jesus. But that faith, that pistis, pisteo, will result in us doing good works. So verse 10 says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Jesus Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So genuine faith will manifest in works. That is why James writes, faith without deeds is dead. Faith is accompanied with works. Expression of our faith. What are some of the expressions of faith? First and foremost is obedience. When we have faith in Christ, we will obey him. And this obedience will be a joyful obedience, not a burdensome obedience. And the motivation to obey will be the love of God, love for God. In John 14, 23, Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. So we love God, we understand that he loves us because the word of God tells us and we explain that love the ultimate expression of the love is his death on the cross. And in, in response to that amazing love, which he, which, he, which he demonstrated on the cross for us, we want to love him in return. 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. And when we love him, we obey him. So obedience is a natural expression of love for God, which comes from understanding his love for us. And when obedience comes from out of love for him, don't be burdensome at all. It will be joyful, not burdensome. First John chapter 5, 3, 4 and 5, John writes, This is love for God, to obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is victory overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is the one who comes to the world? He believes Jesus is the Son of God. So when you have faith in Christ, you will love him in return. And loving God means doing his will. You will obey God joyfully. That's why in the book of Romans, in chapter 1, verse 5, we read, Obedience comes from faith. So faith has genuine expressions. Genuine faith has genuine expressions. Practically to be seen in our lives. These follow faith in Christ. And the primary deed is to obey him. To listen to his teachings and do it joyfully. How many Christians today ask them, is Christian life difficult for you? It's very, very difficult. As the Bible says, it's not burdensome. Because it comes out of love for him. We love him, so we obey him. And we'll have passion to know his will, that we do his will. 
out of love for him. Faith manifests in love. And love for God results in obedience. Number one. Other part I'll talk to a little later. So, in Galatian churches, there was a problem. The Jewish Christians were forcing the Gentile Christians to obey the law of Moses. They couldn't accept the Gentiles also can have salvation. They can also be saved. They couldn't do anything about the salvation. But they wanted them to obey the law of Moses. You must be circumcised. You must keep the Sabbath. All the laws of Moses, you must obey. They're putting on them a yoke they couldn't bear themselves. It happened also in the church in Antioch. And then when they sent messengers to Jerusalem, representatives, and they discussed together, they came up with only four things that the Gentiles should not do. They should avoid sexual morality, avoid eating food sacrificed to idols, avoid eating meat with, of strangled animals, and avoid eating blood. Only four things. Acts 15, chapter 20, 15, chapter 29. From the entire Old Testament law, only four things they were told to abide by in terms of law. In Galatian churches, same problem. The Jewish Christians are forcing the Gentile Christians to obey the law of Moses. And Paul addresses the issue. He writes to them and says, Galatians chapter 5 or 6, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. What matters is faith expressing itself through love. Faith expressing itself through love. Faith has expressions. First of all, love for God and subsequently love for all around us, people around us, our, our neighbors, even our enemies. In the Bible, you find in the churches where they genuine faith in Christ, they love for each other. The Colossian church, for example, it was known for faith in Christ and love for each other. Again, it's a natural expression of faith. Faith Express itself through love. Primarily love for God. First is loving God, which means obeying his teachings, obeying him joyfully, not a burden at all. And second aspect of love for God is taking care of God's people, helping them, doing good works for people. Remember the time when the Lord restored Peter to fellowship with God. After Christ was crucified, Peter went fishing. They all dispersed, all the disciples, all the apostles. We read in the 21st chapter of John how the Lord restores these people, especially Peter. And the Lord, uh, Peter has gone inside fishing to the lake. The Lord is by the Sea of Tiberias. He's preparing breakfast for them. And when Peter realizes that's Jesus, he comes swimming across to the shore. The Lord is asking Peter a question. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? These probably meant the fish are prepared for breakfast because they've gone fishing. Fish took more importance than following the Lord. Do you love me more than these? John 21st chapter 15. And the word this uses for love is the word called agape. Sacrificial love. Godly love. Selfless love. Do you love me more than these? Peter says, you know I love you a lot. But Peter doesn't use the word agape. He uses the word filio. Filio means love as a friend. Question was, do you love me more than this? Agapa. Agapa is the verb of agape. Do you love me more than this? Do you love me sacrificially? Selflessly? What does Peter say? I love you as a friend. Second time, Lord asked him a question. Do you love me? Agape. What does Peter say? I love you a lot as a friend. Third time, the Lord used the word filio. He uses the word filio. As I would say, Peter, don't you love me as a friend? And Peter is get upset about it. Again, they say, yes, I love you, Lord. Three times. Every time they say, I love you, God says, feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Take care of my sheep. So when you love God, you take care of God's people. You do good works. In fact, it says in Galatians 6.10, do good to all, especially the family of believers. So works means for people of this world, helping people. 
It comes out of love for God, which is through faith. So faith results in number one, love for God, then love for people whom God loves. He loves everybody. Wherever it takes you, you go and feed them because you love God. So the real motivation for helping people should be love for God. How often you will find many people in the ministry who are serving people, pastors, teachers, evangelists, who minister to people, they get discouraged because no response. And some people criticize them, they slander them, they gossip behind, they talk, they malicious talk. We tend to lose that zeal for service. We serve people because we love God. Every small thing we do for people, he takes note of. And we serve by faith. Good deeds come from faith. We are saved by faith. Faith results in good deeds. That's why in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, Paul speaks about saved by grace through faith. Goes on to say, for we are God's workmanship. Create in Jesus Christ do good works. So good works follow salvation. Good works can never earn us salvation. All our good works are like filthy rags in the sight of God. They can never give us salvation. Isaiah 64, 6, they're filthy rags. But when this good works come from faith, then as a complete expression of faith. We are all called to do good works, to help people out of love for God. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, we read, Writer writes, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work or the love you have shown him as you help his people and continue to help them. So when you help people, that is good works. When you help them, do good deeds for people, should come from love for God. God is a just God. Everything we do for people, out of love for God, he takes note of. We'll never be the losers. People may not acknowledge it. They may not even thank us for what you're doing. That's when you realize we serve God by faith. Good deeds come from faith. The church in Thessalonica was known for the faith in Christ and love for each other again. But the interesting thing about that, that church is when Paul went and spoke for three Sabbath days, this is the word of God, very eagerness. They believed God, the words that came to Paul were God's words, not Paul's words, which worked in them. So most of after Paul went away, they still were very strong. They still were very strong because they received the word of God as the word of God, not the word of Paul. And then later on, Paul wrote to this church in Thessalonica, he said, he's thanking God for the church. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, He's thanking God for their work produced by faith, labor of love, and endurance inspired by hope. Work produced by faith, labor of love, endurance inspired by hope. Work, labor, endurance are the outward expression which people can see. You work hard, people can see that. You labor, people can see that. You endure trials and suffering, people can see that. What's the basis for that? Faith, love, and hope. Now we go back to 13 chapter of Corinthians, 13 verse. Three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest is love. The foundation is faith, hope, and love. And the expression, what everyone can see, is work produced by faith, Labor of love, endurance inspired by hope. So the main crux, the foundation is the spiritual blessings. The Bible says in Ephesians 1.3, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So the reason why this uh, James 2nd chapter 26 talks so much emphasis on faith and deeds together is only because there are many people who claim their faith, but no deeds. When you see someone very poor, I go, I wish you well. May God take care of you. 
Where is your love? Love has been action, isn't it? And he's given an example of Abraham. His faith is complete by what he did. Rahab, she believed that this God of these people is the real true God, Israelite God. She was a profession, very bad profession. But then she recognized the power behind the people of Israel is the God of Israel, the true God. And she had faith in that God without even knowing him personally. And she was considered righteous because of what she did. The risk of her life and the family's life, she'll protect the spies in the caves. And then that pleased God. So we're saved by faith. we are made righteous by faith. But then that faith has to result in works. So the question is, is there a contradiction between our faith and the work that we do? And when we actually serve God, do we get, do we get this, uh, uh, discouraged by non-response to our sincere work? The real test of our faith is what do we do in the ministry? Are we persisting in it? Are we doing it for the sake of our love for God or out of love for ourselves? How often you find people's work is not recognized, they lose heart. Romans chapter 12, 11th verse says, Never be lacking in seed. Keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. So, I mean, history, in the church history, by many people who simply say, I've got faith. I believe in Jesus. That's what the James writer says, the book of James writer, James, who is the brother of Jesus, he says, you believe in God? Even demons believe. They shudder. They shudder. Demons believe in Christ and they shudder the name of Jesus. We may not shudder the name of Jesus. But they shudder. But they won't do the will of God. Anyone who has faith in Christ will long to find out the will of God and do the will of God. That's why I'm saying, as the Bible says, every Christian is a servant of God. A servant does the will of the master. God has the general will for every believer, every Christian, and a specific will for every Christian. For faith is genuine in Jesus, we put our trust in him, we believe in him as Scripture says we should believe in him. We'll have a passion to know his specific will and go about doing it out of love for him. Not of love for ourselves. Not to get a name for ourselves. But have a genuine desire. Lord, you bought me by your blood, Lord. I will live for you, Lord. That's a calling for every Christian. Second Corinthians 5.15 and he died for all, that those who live will no longer live for themselves. But when who died for them, he was raised again. As we go about helping people, being a servant of people, we help them because we are their servants. Every servant of God is a servant of God's people, whom God puts, us, puts in our responsibility. We serve them as slaves, slaves of God and servants of people. And we will not go back from serving him because he gave a very simple instruction to his service. The motivation for our service, love for God and reward. John 12, 26, the Lord says, whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, my servant also be. My father will honor the one who serves me. He's a just God. Everything we do in his name for people, he takes note of. So never ever say, no one knows what I'm doing. No one is thanking me. No one is acknowledging me or anything. God is not a silent spectator. Everything is watching. He is the motivation behind our actions. Proverbs 16, 2 says, Proverbs 16, chapter 2, All a man's ways seem right to him, but motives are weighed by the Lord. When you serve people, he's checking the motivation. Why are you serving people? Why are you helping people in the church or wherever? You get a good name? That in the church you're known as a person always helping people, always there for the church. There are many people who serve the church but don't serve God. They're very active people. Very busy bodies in the church. To get a name for themselves. For them to know a bit to consider the go-to person in the church. Any problem in the church, go to this person. He's a go-to person in the church. 
I mean, people don't respond to the ministry and acknowledge, they lose heart. Whereas we serve God sincerely, He will lift us up. Always seek honor and glory from God. What an awesome statement He made, Jesus. Whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, a servant will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. And we are supposed to wash each other's feet also. It's an expression of humility. When you do that, it's a very humiliating, not humiliating, humbling experience. Humiliating is a different word. And sometimes we should do it in our churches. Because it's a wonderful, humbling experience. We are servants of people we minister to. Never go slow on whatever God has called you to do. When you put a hand to the plow, don't look back. Keep on serving. The people thank you or don't thank you. The Lord healed 10 people of leprosy. 10 people got healed of leprosy. They came to him. The Lord told them, go and show yourself to the priests. In the Old Testament time, whenever anybody had a skin disease, and a Jew had a skin disease, and they supposed to have been healed by the doctor or whatever, physician, to get a certification that he is that would a priest. High priest, will, high priest will declare he is free of the skin disease. No more leprosy. Lepers cannot enter the temple. In the temple in Jerusalem, there was a Jewish court, Gentile court, outside of the lepers. Lepers can't come inside. But when they heal, they can come inside the Jewish court if they were Jews. But how can they come? How can they be certified they heal? Was the high priest. High priest will say, yes, you are healed. Then they can go back. So here these people come to Jesus, 10 of them. The Lord simply says, Go and show yourself to the priest. Luke 17 chapter, the second part of the chapter, Luke 17. They go. While they went, they got healed. They were not healed in Jesus' presence. As they went to the priest, they got healed. Why did they go to the priest? Because what they meant was, you're going to be healed. They'll certify you're healed. Go and show yourself. When they went, they were not healed. While they were going, they got healed. On the way, they got healed. Or of 10, only one came and thanked him. Remain ten, remain nine, sorry. Forget about thanking him. They didn't even tell him he got healed. Please remember, they got healed while going. They were not healed in Jesus' presence. As they went to the high priest, they got healed. They didn't even come and tell Jesus I got healed. 90%. Did the Lord this guy stop mystery of healing because 90% didn't thank him? Did he stop? He kept on serving. Because in John 4, 34, he says, my food is the will of him who sent me and finish his work. That's my food to do the will of the Father. Now go back to what Jesus said. Not everyone says, Lord, Lord, I the kingdom of God, only does the will of my Father. Not everyone says, Lord, Lord. So I come and say, I healed at miracle signs, I prophesied. God will say, I don't even know you. Away from me. He will do us. He has the will of my Father. When you have faith in Christ, a spontaneous result of that is, Lord, I want to do your will. Look at the way Saul, when he was confronted by Jesus on the road to Damascus, Lord asked him a question. Why do you persecute me? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul says, who are you, Lord? And Jesus another who may persecute me. Second question, what should I do, Lord? First question, who are you? You got the answer. Jesus is persecuting, not Jesus' disciples. Jesus is persecuting. What should I do, Lord? Straight forward. Heart is open. In other words, what do you want me to do? I will do. I am your servant. The Lord says, go to Damascus. So be, you be told what you have. So when a heart open to God to do his service, to his will, he will reveal his will. We call it do his will. A servant does the will of his master. Every one of us who is saved, after receiving salvation, we are called to do the will of the Master. So that's why every Christian is a servant of God. In fact, a slave of Christ. The word servant used in New Testament very often, and mostly it is doulos, which means slave. For example, Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Most Bibles say, it starts off by saying, I, Paul, a servant of Christ called to be an apostle. I, Paul, 
a servant of Christ called to be an apostle. That word servant is actually dulos. It's not servant, it's slave, dulos. A servant works, a slave labors. A worker is worth the wages, a slave not. Not entitled to wages. But God gives it much more than us. Imagine, that's the grace, grace of God. Laboring means taking a beating. That's the meaning of laboring. And the Thessalonians labored out of love. They took a beating in the, in the ministry, whatever they did. Because they loved God. So genuine faith will result in various aspects of, first of all, joyful obedience. Number two, love for God and love for people. Number three, work. Whatever calling you have in this world. When I say work, it doesn't necessarily mean only ministry work. There are many people who are working in, in the marketplace, professionals, and the, the work that they do is a God-given work. God-given work. We work very hard as unto God, for which we need faith. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Colossae, to the slaves in Colossae, slaves. Physical slaves working for earthly masters. They come in those days, slaves working for masters. In Colossians chapter 3, 20 24, he writes, Whatever your task, work it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for men, knowing to receive. Inheritance of God's reward. It's the Lord Christ you are serving. Can you imagine that what he's saying to slaves? Paul was a free man. He wasn't a slave of human beings in that sense. Not a professional slave. He was a willing slave for Christ. But these slaves were actually professionals. They were working for the master who may not have been believer also. What does Paul write? Be the best slave. Work with all your heart as serving God, not men. Who is the actual boss? Jesus Christ, he will reward you. If I was a slave in that, uh, to a recipient of the letter in Colossae, I was a slave, I would tell Paul, Paul, you are a free man. You can talk like that. What do you know about my boss? He's a horrible fellow. How many be the best slave in, my, uh, in his household? How can I be? You don't know what you're talking about. But Paul, that's what he writes. He wrote by the Holy Spirit. He says, you work with all your heart as working with God, not for man. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it's by faith. For a slave, when you can write like that, how much more for people, Christians, who work in the marketplace? How many grumble? Oh, my office is very difficult to work. I'm the only Christian there. We're all, others are all unbelievers. I can't work. I will give an example of people complain like that. I'll tell them, you are the salt of the earth. In your office, you are the salt. You add flavor. In a, in a company, in an office where nobody's a believer, you're the only one there. What a privilege is, what an opportunity it is. You're the salt of the earth, lights of the world. God has put you there to shine. Oh, I'm a minority. All are unbelievers, they're all the rude people. I'm a minority. Praise God, you're a minority. You're the salt. If 90% of chicken biryani was salt, how will it taste? Majority of salt in your chicken biryani, how will it taste? You might be a little bit only, you know, salt. So in your organization, few Christians enough. Too many Christians have a problem. They'll fight for promotions. Few of you, enough. Adding flavor to the organization. Wherever you go, add flavor. That's why it writes in Colossians 4, 6. Colossians 4, chapter 6. Let a conversation be, a conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt. Let a conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt. When you talk among people, when they all talk all kinds of things, gossip, slander, malice, and uh, criticism, you speak words of edification, you add grace to the conversation. Full of grace, seasoning with salt, Christians. So whatever work you do, you do unto God. And promotion comes from God. Psalm 75 verse 6. Promotion comes from the east, not the best, but from the Lord. When I have faith in Christ, it will result in so many manifestations. We are saved by faith, no doubt about it. Ephesians 2, 8, and not taught by works. No way we can be saved by works. Works alone cannot save us. But having saved by faith, that faith and genuine 
will manifest in works and actions. Abraham believed God. Or God said he believed. Not all of you could have children like Sal Universe. He believed. Became righteous because he believed. Then God says, offer Isaac a sacrifice. He willing to offer Isaac a sacrifice. His faith is certain. Actual actions. God saw the faithfulness of Abraham. God knew he had faith. But if God wanted Abraham to know he has faith. Sometimes God wants to do this thing for us to know that we have faith. And Abraham passed the test. So every test we face, they'll pass because God gives us strength to face that test. So we are saved by faith, but faith results in genuine action. And that's how you know. You know them by the fruit, the outcome of the life. So thank God for the amazing fact that he gives us faith. He gives us wisdom, strength to actions for works, that our whole life is complete. And we become blessing to people as God blesses. Let's pray.